Okay, friends and colleagues, we're going to get going. It's about five after the hour. Uh, welcome everybody uh, who has joined us tonight. Um, would be disingenuous if I didn't mention that I know that some of you chose to be here instead of joining that star-studded Amazon uh, webinar tonight. So we especially appreciate uh, the seriousness of purpose that brought you here instead. Um, obviously, in the real world, these things do not compete, but they enhance one another. Uh, and the reason that we're actually here and that we're doing this webinar is because we have reached a moment in our labor movement and in the unfolding and the, the dynamic change that's going on in our labor movement, where it is impossible not to recognize that there are some qualitative changes taking place. There are quantitative changes, of course. We see the massive organizing in Starbucks, the amazing event at Amazon, the incredible degree of organizing going on among journalists and in other sectors in education and in healthcare. Um, but there is also some qualitative shift that we believe in Labor Notes, we believe may be going on. And that's what this webinar is designed to explore. And specifically our topic tonight, as you know, is this question of minority strikes, as we've titled it, minority strikes and majority power. In our labor movement, as long, certainly as long as I have been part of it, so the last half century, the idea has been, of course, you can't go on strike unless you have a very, very solid majority, a super majority of your members who are committed, who are willing to go out, who are willing to stay out as long as needed uh, to win what you're fighting for. Um, there are many, many uh, campaigns for contracts that were strong contract campaigns that um, stopped short, um, in, that, in our view, that stopped short of what they could achieve because they felt they didn't have enough strength to, to go on strike. Um, given that, the fact that the panelists here tonight represent two very recent, very powerful minority strikes is something we really wanted to dig into and investigate. It may be something that has to do particularly with the nature of uh, the education sector and graduate student union, or it may be broader than that. It's something for us to come to understand. So um, with that, we are going to begin. It's a great pleasure for me to be together here with um, uh, four comrades that I had the chance to work with a lot through each of their strikes. Um, I'm Ellen David Friedman. I'm on the board of Labor Notes. Um, I've worked as an organizer in the ed education sector for, for many years. Um, and with me tonight are Katrine Evanson and Joanna Lee uh, from Columbia University, Jack Davies and Stefan Young from UC Santa Cruz, uh, all really outstanding, principled, hardworking, and lovely leaders in their own unions. They are members uh, of UAW. And um, the format that we are going to use is I'll be asking, I'll be asking them questions um, that we hope get at some of the um, most salient uh, issues here. You are welcome to put questions into the uh, question and answer uh, chat. Um, we'll, we'll probably talk for about an hour or so and then begin taking questions and wrap up at 9.30 Eastern time. Okay, before we get going with the, what was this? What do we mean by a minority strike? How did you do it? Um, I'd just like to ask each of you to respond to the question, well, what did you win? Because we don't go on strike just for fun, although it may be fun. We go on strike because we are fighting to win stuff. Um, so please answer in whatever you, way you want. And, and just to sort of uh, save time here, um, I'll just call in folks. Uh, Jack, do you want to begin? Sure. Thank you, Alan. Uh, you know, the most obvious and direct thing that we won was an 11% raise effectively mid-contract, um, you know, in the middle of a four-year contract with a pretty clear no strike uh, clause in it. Uh, 
But on top of that, or as well as like a, like a funding guarantee, a sort of minimum uh, of five years of, of funding for workers on our campus. But in addition to that, like a, just a far more robust um, a campus organizing culture um, has, has sort of come out of the other side of this as well. And, you know, it's, that was all great. It, it, one can't help but wonder what might have been um, without the pandemic. Yeah, I'll pick a line ending with the pandemic lockdowns as well. Jack, thank you. Stefan, please pick up from there. Well, I would say that, you know, what, what we won was like a, a, a real shift in the organizing capacity among, um, you know, people who would self-identify as organizers on our campus, but also among um, rank and file workers in the sense that um, since the strike, what we've had is like a, a real building of connections among um, workers who are real, who, who are willing to take initiative within the you know individual departments and so on where um, you know when we when we started organizing around cost of living adjustment around cola um, at that period in fall of 2019 um, we were all sort of attending union meetings and being in union spaces and attendance at those meetings was in, in around the single digits. Um, now that's kind of a distant memory. Um, we have like a real robust, um, you know, both organizing capacity and also maybe a, a, a reputation on the campus in which um, when, when we mobilize around issues because of you know, the, the wildcat strike um, and all its ups and downs, uh, organizers on this campus have developed maybe like a, a little bit of a reputation that we, we are, we're serious people and we're willing to organize around concrete issues and get results. And we're willing to put uh, concepts into actions and um, that has gained us a, a lot of support and a lot of new connections. Um, it's allowed us to build a, 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 a ton of trust, um, to be honest, with, with new people who maybe were around during the Wildcat strike, but especially um, with people who were not around during that time. They have come into a workplace in which, you know, the, the core organizers from that time um, come across as, as serious, as committed, and as people who are willing to um, come up with plans to win demands around concrete campaigns. Oh, that makes my organizer's heart sing, Stefan. Changing the culture and giving legitimacy to the union, to the ideas of unionism has got to be our goal. That's magnificent. Joanna, please tell us what you want in Colombia. Yeah, so I can speak a little to, um, sorry, everyone, I'm just like, I have a little cold. So if I sound a little hard, just, just put it in the chat so that I know. Um, but um, we won a really strong first contract. Um, and that first contract meant that um, the lowest paid workers got a raise of almost, you know, 23% or so. Um, those of us who were on nine month appointments, um, who often find ourselves very vulnerable, um, got raises of between nine to 11%. Um, for other workers, some of the highest paid workers amongst us, they got raises of around 6%. Um, we won dental care. Um, we also won um, third party, you know, neutral arbitration, which is a standard labor procedure for discrimination and harassment, which Columbia um, and many other Ivy League universities have been trying to carve out um, of labor contracts on the grounds that they consider this a student issue and not a labor issue, um, which of course, you know, we know they want to hide behind their own processes. Um, and on top of that, and I think this is really important, we want recognition of our union. Um, and for a lot of people, they might think that, you know, that's not a big deal, but for us, you know, we got recognition from the NLRB and Columbia still refused to um, recognize us. For them, they were willing to do something totally illegal, right? The highest kind of body for labor law said that we are a union, these are the people in it, and Columbia still refused um, to recognize us as a union and consistently tried to carve workers out 
of that definition. So that's something that we want. Um, and it's a really strong first contract that I think has set a new standard um, for lots of other labor you know, unions in, in the higher ed sector. Excellent, Joanna. And just in case people have missed it, and she says recognition, it means everybody. There are no one, no one that does graduate student work is excluded. Not on the basis of hours or job titles. It's an extraordinarily broad wall-to-wall -wall definition, which the university did not want to give up. Uh, Katrine, please go ahead. Yeah, and I think one of the big ones for recognition too is that we also um, included undergraduates. So undergraduate workers, um, we're still on, in this battle, but it's a really significant battle because it's one that um, that's the case that uh, at the NLRB was given to uh, that recognition was a fight that we already it already started in 2016, right, or way before. So, um, and we're still on that path, but I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that today. I think, I guess, uh, just to add on to what Joanna was saying, one of the big things that we won was, and this was a learning process that uh, through the number of strikes that we did since 2017, we've changed also the culture of our union. And we really, this was the strike, and I hope we'll get to talk about this today too, but this was the strike that um, we were able to kind of uh, carry out in the way that we wanted or we thought uh, was um, the way to do it and not following traditional union models that we uh, didn't really believe were in the spirit of the kind of unionism that we believed in. So um, yeah, but the, the main gains I think uh, Joanna mentioned, so. Thank you, Katrine. And that's an excellent jumping off point for the first question, which I'll pose to you, Stefan. Um, you know, so as I mentioned before, the conventional wisdom is you can't have a strike um, without a majority or a super majority. Can you tell us what a minority meant in the case of UC Santa Cruz? What did it mean in your context? Well, to be honest with you, you know, in the in the build up to the decision to go on Wildcat strike in December 2019, um, these terms minority and majority, they did not come up for us. Um, I feel pretty strongly that at the time, you know, we had um, we had deliberations uh, around what was possible and what was not possible, but, but these exact terms around um, majority and minority were not things that were in the mouths of either organizers or rank and file workers who, who we were drawing into the struggle. Um, and I guess as the the you know as as we discuss and and say a bit more about the blow by blow of of how the the strike unfolded, um, those kinds of, of of different questions will become a bit more obvious. But it's really only in this kind of hindsight that um, the mi minority majority question becomes relevant to us at the time. Um, and I'm thinking especially of that period of December 5th to December 8th. So that period where the decision was ultimately made to go on Wildcat strike. Um, I think it's unequivocal that, you know, um, all respect to the conventional wisdom, conventional wisdom comes from somewhere, right? Like no one would dispute that having more workers on strike is better than having fewer workers on strike. At the same time, uh, in the context of a, of a wildcat action, like what was being uh, contemplated on our campus, um, we were thinking across sort of like different lines, uh, thinking about um, willingness to take action relative to the, the, the newness of the campaign that we were putting forward. And also about this idea of maybe like a critical mass where one of the things that we did here at the, at the time was, you know, we don't need to have everyone but we do need to have enough. And I think um, when it comes time to talk about a critical mass of, about how many workers is enough, you have to be attuned to the concrete conditions of a particular workplace in order to make that call. Um, and, and that's those were the lines that we were we were thinking along. Um, you know, it's not through uh, preset formulas or percentages that you can know how many is enough. It depends upon like an analysis of the conditions in a, in a particular workplace, and and in our context, you know, 
um, where we can talk more about, you know, at varying stages through our wildcat strike, um, what were our numbers at different stages of the movement. But um, for that critical, pivotal moment where we decided to go on strike, December 2019, we cannot discuss the numbers without also discussing uh, the nature of the disruption. And the nature of the disruption that was being discussed was a grading strike. So right at the end in December, at the end of the fall term, uh, what was being discussed was a decision to withhold all of the final grades from the, the many, many undergraduates that the, the teaching assistants were, were, were responsible for. Um, so the number of those grades and uh, the short notice for management, where management needs those grades to kind of, uh, you know, carry along with its normal functioning. And the fact that uh, the grades were due sort of 10 days after uh, the, the idea of a strike first came about, that it was very short notice that we knew at the time that uh, uh, a large number of workers were willing to take that disruptive step that we knew would be extremely uh, kind of overwhelming for the administrative apparatus of management because they were not expecting it to happen. And, and frankly, neither would we. Uh, uh, but, but we were acting upon a, a sentiment that we felt and you know, based on our assessments at the time, um, we thought that, yeah, we didn't have everyone, but but we had enough. Uh, Stefan, thank you. You've introduced this idea of this a strategic analysis. Strikes are supposed to hurt the employer. That's the purpose of strikes. They're not supposed to be symbolic. They're not for photo opportunities. They're supposed to hurt the employer from doing business. So Joanna, actually, why don't you pick that up for Columbia, because you all made a strategic decisions about this as well. <clears throat> yeah, and I think something that might be helpful is to also um, contextualize our fall 2021 strike against the spring 2021 strike. Um, and this is the cat that I'm finally going to let out of the bag, which is that our fall, our fall 2021 strike actually had lower participation in terms of numbers than the one in spring 2021. Um, this was not something we talked about a lot during the fall, but if we actually looked at absolute numbers, we had more in spring 2021. The difference, the reason why the spring 2021 strike did not get us a contract that we could ratify with a you know, unifying yes, but the one in the fall did was precisely because of what Stefan talked about, where we actually looked at the concrete conditions and made decisions to continue, right? So, you know, in the spring of 2021, we had a three week strike. It was paused undemocratically by the bargaining committee. Um, and after that, the energy kind of fell away it dissipated and there was no more leverage, right? Once we ended that strike. Um, and of course we can't change history, but it gives us something, something to think about, right? What would have happened if that strike had actually, you know, taken on that momentum that was there and just continued um, to kind of victory, right? Where we could actually say, this is when we have won. Um, and, um, but what we decided to do in the fall of 2021, when we recognized that, you know, with the kind of burnout and disappointment of the last struggle, we were not going to get, um, you know, the same numbers, let alone a majority. So something that we were consistently told was that we need 1,500 out of 3,000 for us to be able to have a majority strike. And that was why the last strike was paused. Instead of thinking of it that way, we asked ourselves, exactly what Stefan said, what is the critical mass that we need um, to actually build that momentum and hurt the employer? Um, and that's how we actually made many strategic decisions. Um, so for example, we really focused the organizing around um, instructors of record and teaching assistants um, instead of organizing, say, some of the groups that have never had, you know, um, any sort of like strike experience, interactions with the union, we sort of had them as part of our consciousness in terms of how do we bring them in without necessarily saying from the outset, your first contact with the union is, is that you have to go on strike and that we have to just like get these commitments to get 1,500. Like instead of doing that, we really focused on like building deeper relationships 
um, including saying to some of these people that there will be other ways for them to participate and focusing on solidifying the kind of commitment of the core um, that would really hit Columbia where, where it hurts. Excellent, Joanna, thank you. Um, and so this really, you have both introduced this concept of sort of critical mass. There needs to be a core, you need to be very clear and directed. Um, we still have to go from small to big. It may not have to be everybody, but it's gotta be big. So Jack, can you address in uh, the Wildcat strike at UC Santa Cruz, how you went from small to big? Thanks, so. Owen. Yeah, I think it's a, you know, very important question because I think the de facto is we're all small groups, whether we are you know, organizers on our campus, whether we're the union leadership, wherever we are, we're probably uh, starting small um, in, in the current moment, or at least in, in our workplace, that's true. And, and actually our, you know, our demand, which you know, we're calling a COLA, which we called a COLA rather, but really um, was about uh, the category of rent burden. And it was a demand to lift uh, every worker on our campus out of rent burden such that we would be only paying a maximum of 30% of our wage um, on our rent. And Santa Cruz is an you know, extremely expensive rental market. And this demand actually was articulated a full year before uh, this, this fall 2019 in the context of some like coalitional organizing that a few of us were involved in. So it was like a, a, you know, a sort of like group of small little groups, self-identified activists, organizers, and you know, we were there as you know, people in the union on our campus. And this was like our demand you know, pinned onto a very long laundry list of, of other demands, um, extremely different qualities, um, you know, different, just very, very different, very different priorities. And you know, what ended up happening is that our messaging, our activity, everything was sort of guided by uh, our internal dynamics and like interpersonal conflicts. And it was a very much like, uh, like, you know, like a hall of mirrors sort of like organizing experience. And unsurprisingly, we got absolutely nowhere and, and disintegrated. Um, and so as, you know, the, the group of unionists who had survived that, uh, we you know, decided that we need to regroup and become much more coherent ourselves as like a small group um, before we joined any other, you know, coalitional uh, kind of thing. I think this dynamic is, is actually more prevalent than, than people think. Um, that there's a certain, often like a certain wishfulness uh, inside self-identified organizing groups, which are, you know, often very small and just people who are willing to go to meetings all the time. Uh, a certain wishfulness or sentiment that the workers should care about something. You know, they ought to care about this like, set of legislative proposals or they should care about this technical demand or this petition uh, of whatever kind, like it, it, it should speak to their interests. Um, that this is sort of what's guiding a lot of activity or action because this is what the internal group decided what was important, this existing small group. But anyway, for us, the way it turned out, and this, was, this is like a lesson we've learned in hindsight, but uh, sort of stumbled upon um, a different approach, which was to plan out a year long uh, campaign over the summer around the singular demand for the cost of living adjustment to end rent burden. And for this fall, which Stefan described the end of the fall term, the whole uh, plan was simply to make the demand circulate. So we're emailing it out. Uh, we fly it it's like everywhere we could. We had lots of conversations. Everyone's email signatures had their rent burden in it. Um, so all this like most visible way, we, in every visible way we could imagine, we made this issue of people's rent burden like uh, circulate. We had you know marches, confrontations with the chancellor, like a big day out at the base of campus, like organizing meetings in, in public, all this sort of thing. And basically, this took off like quicker and you know, more explosively than we ever, ever could have hoped. Um, and it got to the point right before where Stefan started earlier, where workers who we did not know, had never met, started using the terms of our campaign. They were talking about their rent burden and their need for a COLA. Uh, and they were calling for strike action, in fact. People we'd never seen in a meeting before in our lives were saying, if, if, if we're serious about this, we need to strike, we need to take action. And what I'm most proud of of our small group is how quickly we, we responded to that, uh, and some of which Stefan described earlier. And I guess you know, the lesson for us here is that in hindsight, it's obvious this demand was a good one, <laughs> but uh, the reasons for that were not necessarily clear at the time. And 
we think now that it was because it was like the singular demand. It wasn't a list. You know, it was it was it was it was clear, and intuitive in its terms, and it spoke to the really the most humiliating part of of workers' lives. Um, you know, on our on our campus in our workplace, uh, and the demand itself carried with it like its own solution, like a really transformative, uh, robust uh, demand that would fix the problem and really change people's lives in a, in a deep and material way. And maybe it's you know only in hindsight that you can know that any one like demand has this quality, but what it does require of your small group is a certain receptiveness, like a, a, like a willingness to like listen and watch how people are responding. And, and change, shift, drop things, uh, you know, totally throw out your plans as necessary. And I think those are things we did really well, uh, you know, as we look back at it now, and that's what allowed this, you know, pretty insular group of like kind of, you know, uh, pathological people <laughs> to make a, a, a demand like really uh, expand and, and have, have the demand get taken up. It was no longer our campaign. And that was, that was clear by early December. Hey Jack, thank you. I just want to point out um, to people listening that um, in both cases, we've already heard that um, each core group of very, very committed activists had to overcome a previous, a prior event that had not ended well, a prior bargaining campaign or a prior strike that was weak. And so I just want to underscore that because organizing is never linear. It is always relies on your ability to keep your intentions in front of you to face the, the unexpected thing and figure out a way to keep going. Uh, I think Jack's just given a beautiful example of that. Uh, you both have. Uh, Katrine, if I could ask you, um, as has been said here already, it's not like you don't wanna have a majority strike. That's always a really good goal, um, but it's not always possible. Could you talk a little bit at Columbia, um, what, what do you think were the obstacles to achieving a majority and what allowed you to take the leap anyway? Yeah, I think, um, well, I guess I'll, I'll, I would wanna add something before I, I answer that um, in, with regards to the numbers, because I think that for us also, we really recognize how this number issue was, was a, a question of control in our spring 2021 strike. So having access or not to what the numbers of our strikers was, was a point of contention. So when we got to the strike in the fall, we really wanted to kind of take control of uh, and, and make, it, make this like a decision making process. So that's how we um, sort of implemented these polls where everyone could weigh in and vote on whether to continue and so get an assessment of that. In terms of the in terms of the obstacles, I think that one of the biggest things that we faced was that there was a, a, a change of the pace structure. So as we that meant that um, students or workers that were coming into the fall were suddenly faced with uh, not having enough money to pay for their uh, big lump sum payments that they have to uh, issue to Columbia Housing, for instance, where you have to pay like the semester in full or these kinds of issues, right? So there was, um, there was a lot of uh, demoralization of uh, students in front of that uh, change, but there was also a lot of anger and a lot of clarity around how the university was, uh, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, not interested in helping uh, its workers or students or whatever they want to call us. So, so I think that that was, it was kind of like it had like this dual element of on the one side people were you know were scared uh, and rightly so because they didn't know how they were going to financially sustain a strike that they a lot of them believed in um and on the other hand it really helped us galvanize on that and it was a moment of yeah of, of clarity a learning moment of understanding what the antagonism was and how yeah so so i think that though it was about turning these opportunities into something that we could organize around um, and uh, I think in that way, we were able to prepare well. We had a hardship fund that really had, you know, helped sustain strikers materially. We had these polls where everyone, um, you know, as coming from this experience that I mentioned earlier about numbers being an issue and people really trying to control and make decisions that without, you know, being fully transparent about what the numbers were. Now we had these polls and the results were, um, you know, uh, 
shared publicly. And it was also an organizing tool for us because we could, you know, we could get to see what the numbers were, what the composition of our workers was. So how many, you know, instructors that have full classes versus how many research assistants or we could have like these numbers and understand the composition of our strike. Um, and in that way, it really also helped us target the kind of workers we needed to organize in order to, you know, sustain the, the hurt that we were. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I think that those were, um, you know, the union busting, the belief, I mean, there was a little bit, not as much, but I think that also more traditional union models where at the beginning, especially when we, you know, we, it was a bit of a leap of faith in a moment where we were like, okay, well, do we have the numbers? Do we not? We go on strike, we do this, we push with the, with the moment. And, um, and in those moments, there was talk about having, um, I forget what you call it, like the rotational strikes where people come in and out of the strike. And um, we talked about, uh, you know, there was more of like reactionary forces within the union. They were talking about, you know, the peak of our strike power is the day before we go on strike. Um, so those were all kind of um, discourses that we really need to kind of push through and convince people that, no, this was the, this, this was the way that it was gonna work. Maybe to, to finish, I would say that like the uh, we were coming from a strike a few months earlier where we had been on strike for three weeks. Um, so I think that mentalizing people that we were going to have to be in this for four weeks at least right before we were going to see any results. So really kind of working and sustaining people's um, morale and knowing that, you know, that, that this, we were going to be in for a while. This wasn't going to be two weeks strike and we're done. So you know, we ended up staying on strike for 10 weeks. Um, and maybe, you know, I would say that um, I think that the three week strike really taught us that, that, um, that in order for us to really impact, it was going to, you know, it was one and done. We needed to get out of here. We needed to have a contract. It was four years. Um, so, yeah. So I think that all those things were as much of obstacles as they were opportunities to organize people and help them see that we could push through. Beautiful framing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's let's move to the question now of power. Um, the strike is obviously always about power. Um, uh, Jack, I think I'll put this to you, and then Joanna to you. Uh, what was your analysis of power? How did you think you were going to move the employer? And is that what happened? Yeah, I mean, we moved into certain things. That's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, yeah. So, as, you know, as Stefan and I were saying earlier, the original um, labor action here was the grading strike, uh, which just means withholding uh, final grades at the end of the fall uh, quarter or term. Two months later, we were out on the picket um, in response to like, threats of retaliation. It was a sort of like you know, point of escalation, but. Uh, for the original, for the original decision to to go, you know, to take that first leap and take that first action, um, it was partially determined by timing, um, because there, there were no classes really uh, after, you know, for for another month from from the point we were making the decision, and we also thought, look, it's a good, uh, easier step into like a, a real strike, you know, what was, what would be like a real uh, obvious withdrawal of labor, but what was interesting, uh, as it turned out, is that um, at least as measured by how management responded and what they retaliated for, the missing grades uh, had perhaps more power than the empty classrooms. Um, and this is maybe just a commentary on you know, public higher education or something, but um, more, you know, more concretely in, in terms of our struggle with our boss, it, it was extremely disruptive to have, you know, in excess of 10,000 grades missing um, for all kinds of like processing things. But as we discovered later, um, not necessarily at the time, uh, it had an effect on financial aid rollover and like, student debt stuff. So effectively it disrupted uh, certain uh, funding mechanisms uh, that the you typically roll over from quarter to quarter when uh, the grades come in. Um, so this, you know, made the university uh, or let the university sort of message that you know, we, were, we were harming the undergraduates, we were holding them back, we were affecting their financial aid. And I guess what was um, 
good about this for us was that it, it gave us some specific organizing tasks that really I think uh, catapulted our, our our organizing forward and our power and put us in a position to take uh, to take the kind of uh, picket line action that we did later. Because you know, at least on our campus, we're you know, we're outnumbered to twelve to one with undergrads, so undergrad support is like, crucial to big public uh, spectacular things like a picket line. Uh, so what I mean by that is, you know, a, a group of grads started like meeting with the registrar regularly and really rigorously understanding how the financial aid system worked, how the grade processing worked. This whole kind of like this process that is totally opaque to anyone who's not you know in those office in those offices. And it meant that we could communicate very clearly to the undergrads what actually happens with their grades, with their debt, uh, you know, with and who really actually needs it and who are they saying needs it. Um, so we were able to give the grades to the students who like qualify, you know, we made these FAQs like uh, if you are this person, then this, then this, then this. And if it led to ask your TA for your grade, you got your grade. Um, and what and then you know, the university, for example, started not accepting partial rosters. So you couldn't just give one or two grades, you had to give them all. But then, of course, the question is who is really harming these undergrads and holding them back and preventing them from getting their, you know, their, their aid was an obvious one. And then the final, the final point of this was that it, it put it on us as like an organizing task for every single striker to go get their own undergrads on board with this plan. To, and then we, you know, we had undergrads like begging their TAs to withhold their grades in, in certain cases. Um, so this is just to say that it was a, you know, un, like an atypical. Uh, strike action clearly it didn't you know it, it it involved the withholding of one hour you know the, the time it takes to submit a roster or something like this um but it was extremely disruptive um and the university was entirely un, unprepared for it um in some ways we were as well um for exactly what it meant to do what we did when we did it um but certainly like a a lesson to to take forward for you know thinking of what kinds of actions in saying that, the you know the picket also did a lot of important work. Um, in you know people got to spend time together. Uh, they got to you know really confront um, the repressive forces of this university. You know battalions of police, um, and you know sort of and like stare down those kinds of threats. Uh, it made it extremely public. Moved it from sort of local news to national news. Uh, led us to build a strike fund that could support us when we were fired. Um, and all these kinds of things. So just to say like, uh, you know, multiple, multiple vectors of like understanding what power was in uh, the move of this, of this strike, of this strike sequence. Jack, thank you. Joanna. <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'll start with where our key leverage lay and also talk about the things that helped us kind of preserve that. So the most important thing for us was keeping our core on strike, but a lot of that core were in what we call instructors of record. So what this means is they, they are students who teach their own classes, they don't TA, um, and they formed the core of the group um, that went on strike. Part of that is because Columbia has this core curriculum that all undergrads um, have to take and most of those courses are, are taught um, by student workers. So um, that was really um, the kind of core focus and the core group we had to keep going for the entire period. So language instructors, people, people teaching the core curriculum, people teaching introduction to university writing, um, those people. Um, and the other thing is that it was extremely expensive for Columbia to hire scabs to replace these instructors. Um, and part of that has to do with the fact that um, many of us are kind of like specialized. Um, so it's really hard, for example, to hire someone from the French department to like teach like Portuguese in the Latin American Iberian cultures department. There might be some overlap, but chances are probably not. Um, so we knew that Colombia then had to seek people outside the community um, and that would have been too costly uh, kind of process for them. So we knew that if those people went on strike it would really hurt undergraduate education um, in a way that really cuts Columbia off from one of their, you know, key revenue streams, which is um, tuition, right, from undergrads. So there were also these undergrads who then participated in our struggle, um, whose, you know, parents, families were also really upset that they were paying, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in tuition and their education was being disrupted. Um, and so we also had to work with undergrads to kind of educate them on what's going on. So their parents were writing in emails in our favor, um, um, really telling Columbia enough is enough. Um, 
And along with that, something that was really important, and because I think some people in the crowd may, may be also organizers in higher ed, but um, something that was important for us was hitting a kind of timeline where students would lose credit for the courses they were taking because they did not have enough course hours in the semester. So um, because we started in the middle, we, it was a long way to go before we got to the grading strike. We were like, what is our other source of leverage? And that was hitting kind of around the four week point of our strike. Most undergrads whose instructors were on strike um, would not be able to get credit for those courses. And that became really important when we were trying to negotiate um, pay because we didn't get paid during the strike at all. We were basically saying to the university, you need us to do the makeup work so that these students can get their credits. And if you want us to do makeup work, you should pay us our wages that we had lost on strike. Um, so that was a really key um, point of leverage. Um, but of course, it's incredibly difficult to keep these people on strike. People were losing almost $1,000 every week in terms of wages. People couldn't pay their rents. It was really difficult. Um, so something that I think was really important for us was looking outwards in moments of crisis for support from the broader labor movement. Um, and actually, every single panelist on this call was really important to that, um, because it was actually Stefan and Jack um, who had kind of intervened in that moment. Um, but around the fourth week of our strike, Columbia responded uh, with retaliation, threatening to replace all striking workers in the spring. So they basically sent an email that said that by December 10th, if you were still on strike, um, you would not get a spring appointment, which is terrifying because for a lot of people that means, you know, you might not have, you know, income in the spring, you might lose your visa status, you'll lose the employment status. It's very complicated. So everyone was kind of in a frenzy. And in that moment, um, we sort of drew on the COLA strike um, at UCSC and realized that what we had to do when the boss retaliates is to escalate. Um, and that's what we did. We shut down campus on December 8th. Um, we had these hard picket lines. And what happened in that moment was um, the entire labor movement showed up for us. So we had you know, people from other unions, New Skill, Teamsters, like NYU GSOC showed up. Um, everyone in the city showed up and it was really a show of force to Columbia. Um, I was on the picket line when some of Columbia's bargaining team members were like trying to get through the picket and just got yelled at, um, not even by Columbia students, just by, you know, members of the labor movement in New York City. Um, and they had to address it at bargaining the next day. They were like, you know, this can't happen again. And when your employer responds, it's really a sign that you're doing something right. Like that your employer is saying, don't do it, suggests that you're creating an impact. Um, so that kind of really turned things around for us. Very soon after, Columbia gave in to all our demands. Um, and something that you know was an outcome of that too was that the people who were on the fence, the people who weren't sure, who were like, no, it's time for me to back out, it's too much risk. That action, when they saw the whole city come out for us, they were like, actually, I can do this. I can stay on strike, I can continue fighting for what I think is right, what, what me and my coworkers deserve in this moment. Um, so I think that that was um, really important for us in our analysis of power. And that question of like, do we have a majority at that moment wasn't really part of the discourse. Instead, we were thinking about how we can really show Colombia that we're gonna fight till the end. The, the mention of um, bringing other um, uh, actors to shift the balance of power, it is always on our minds in the labor movement um, because <clears throat> it is true that when you find other people walking sort of shoulder to shoulder with you and in the case of grad student strikes, obviously if you can get undergraduates, if you can get faculty members, if you can get other unionists and so on, feels very important. But one of the really interesting things that I would like to focus on in addition to this, which is pretty unusual, um, actually, amazingly unusual, um, is how in the Columbia strike, um, you managed to find important roles and methods of democratic participation for your coworkers who were not on strike. Those are the people we normally call scabs and won't ever talk to and shun and revile and so on. You, you took a different approach. Katrine, could you talk about um, 
how non-striking co-workers and members of the union were, were brought in to support the strike. Yeah, so, and I think I'll, I'll give a little background context of that, of the categories, because there's the scabs, like the people who decide not to strike that are what we're calling on appointment, which means that are in the bargaining unit at the time that we were uh, on strike. And then there was a lot of people that uh, weren't, uh, couldn't strike, but were on, in solidarity with the strike and would have struck if they'd been on appointment. So, um, so we had like these two categories or three categories with the strikers. And um, I guess the first thing is that um, in the spring of 2021, when we did our first strike, the, the administration implemented the system of attestation, which meant that we would have to uh, say whether we had worked in a certain period of time and that those periods were renewed every so often, like they were, we would be sent an email, you know, every 15 days saying, Had, have you worked in the past 15 days? And so, um, so by the time we got to the fall strike, the university just automatically implemented this, uh, um, this system again. And so that we knew that that was going to happen. So there was a lot of organizing of like, okay, you can, you know, can you at least not attest so that we don't give away our numbers to the university? And so we, I think we were quite successful in that because um, everyone kind of was familiar with the system and they knew that we we're gonna get paid at some point. So, um, so if you were someone who was scabbing, for instance, and decided not to attest in solidarity, you would then be able to claim those wages after we had gone back to work and just said like, I did, I did work in those periods and you would get your wages back. So there was a, you know, there was a lot of um, sort of movement to do that. And we, would, we did that a lot at, at a department level where we could really track who was on strike and who was not. Other ways in which we did that that I think are quite unconventional is that because we implemented this um, poll system to vote whether we would stay on strike on a weekly basis, and that was something that was really key to um, bringing people in to decide in a moment where they had felt very alienated in the spring, where this strike in the spring was undemocratically stopped. Um, and we didn't, you know, we're, weren't able to really um, have participate in that decision. So it was very important to us to have some sort of system where people could voice uh, whether they were supporting the strike another week. And so in that, we also allowed non-strikers, um, so scabs, to vote. And even so, we were able to, um, to win the vote every week. And so I think that was really key. I think another way which, in which we brought in um, you know, scabs was, uh, or non-strikers was in um, our open bargaining system. So everyone was able to attend. I mean, everyone means the large audience. And then, um, so we would have faculty in those open bargaining sessions. It would be administration, you know, people from the administration in them. Um, but then in caucus, where, what, you know, when we made decisions on strategy and on the kind of demands and how we would orient the, our next session or our next um, yeah, session with the university, we would allow people to also have an opinion and decide, you know, and weigh in on these demands, weigh in on strategy. So I think that in that way, it, it really sort of showed how we could really cultivate that this was a majority of people. So even though you're not striking, you're actually deciding, um, you know, what, what the demands are, you're deciding what the strategy is. Um, yeah, so I think those are kind of... Um, and I, yeah, those, those were, I think those were the ways. I don't know if I'm missing anything, Joanna, but. Just for the record, <clears throat> I have never heard of a strike in my 50 years of experience in which you allowed the scabs to vote. It was breathtaking, but I kept seeing the evidence. You were building majority power. That's what you were paying attention to through a really strict understanding of democratic decision-making. It was it was extraordinary, and I, my thinking about this entire question has changed as a result of having been through that. Um, a question for you, Stefan, from uh, someone in the audience: um, How did you go about doing your analysis of power, especially with respect to the grading strike? It's so atypical, but interesting conclusion, and your analysis had to be spot on. So, um, please. Go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about your analysis that led to the decision about the grading strike? <clears throat> sure. So, you know, in the in the immediate lead up to the decision to go on grading strike, I think 
it's important to emphasize that there was such a short turnaround between the the day that we knew that um, there was a strike in the air. So like the event that Jack referenced a bit earlier, the day that people from outside the core organizing group who we had never we had never seen in meetings before were sort of openly calling for a strike. The time, the period between that day and the day that we eventually made the decision to go on strike, that was that was three days. So it was a it was a very high pressure situation in which like the best thing we did was probably to you know abandon all our previous plans and act quickly upon energy that we saw on the ground. Um, and we we did this in a number of ways. So the first indication that we got was this sort of outpouring of energy and militancy from uh, rank and file workers who are not already organizers. The second thing we did was to do a kind of, uh, you know, cursory, like quantitative study, or, or, or at least like a survey of the workers who could be on strike. And at the time, it was about 750 to 800 workers who could have gone on strike uh, in that term. And within less than 24 hours, we had over 400 of those workers like filling in like a hastily created Google form uh, that that was was basically, you know, a, 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 a very straightforward survey about would you be willing to to take wildcat strike action over the demand for a cost of living adjustment and the responses were overwhelming. So in turn, that survey made us call like a, a real emergency in person meeting of uh, grad workers on our campus in which we we booked up a whole uh, large lecture hall. Uh, the room was full to spilling people sitting on seats. Uh, we had like definitely over like 100 people in the room itself um, with more sort of on the stairs and then a, a solid like 40 to 50 people on Zoom. Um, this was on a Sunday afternoon, mind you. Uh, and again, on this very short notice, and and the energy in that room where we tried to do our due diligence, um, you know, seizing upon the energy and acknowledging that people were calling for this grading strike, we tried to present uh, two things: first, pros and cons of going on strike right now, and second, pros and cons of doing the grading strike as the action. Um, so we presented these things, and at the end, we called for a sort of like show of hands to see who was willing to take action literally the very next day, like Monday of finals week, this was the, the next day. And it was like a, a sort of unanimous uh, show of hands in that overcrowded lecture hall, that kind of like in-person um, energy and, you know, willingness to take action and, you know, people's, people sort of inspiring each other in person was honestly nothing like I, I've ever seen before. Um, and has has like shaped a lot of my uh, feelings towards what is possible uh, since then. And so from that moment on, you know, we kind of fed off the, the energy of what was possible at the time. I think in response to this person's question, like right at the beginning, we knew that something was there. Like we saw all, we, we took a bunch of different um, measurements of what the energy was. And every time we did that, we got, a positive response, like a positive feedback that an overwhelming number of people, more than we could have imagined prior, were ready. Subsequently, um, we had to take two paths. One was to consolidate and one was to escalate. And what I mean by that is when I say escalate, I mean the sort of public facing stuff that most people think about when they think about the UC Santa Cruz wildcat strike. They think about the photos from the picket line, the big groups of undergrads that we turned out, uh, the grad students who were not on strike, who came out in solidarity, um, you know, the press, the kind of like confrontations with the police, um, our big strike fund, you know, sort of uh, statements of solidarity from other unions, from uh, politicians and so on. That's the sort of escalation path, which I think we did well. The funny thing about the grading strike, and this is this is a thing that we've had to acknowledge among ourselves, is that when you do a grading strike, it's a grading strike for a certain term. And so once you get X number of people on strike who have already withheld the grades, 
it's not quite like other strikes where you start with a certain number and then you build. When you do a grading strike, you can only lose people because the only option is you've either either already submitted the grades or you withheld the grades and then you fold it and then you, you submit uh, belatedly. And so those were the, the kind of two parts, escalation or consolidation. And what we, you know, this is a kind of like reflective thing that we think about is we should have done a lot more to consolidate, to sort of bring in the, like strengthen our networks among the people who decided to go on strike, who like, you know, as Jack and I have said, Lots of those people, we had no prior connections with them. Um, and it was, you know, objectively hard in the time frame that we had to, to build those connections and to build those relationships of trust. Um, I'd say, you know, one of the things that we have now is we're much more capable of doing that kind of thing now than we were in 2019, 2020, because of the, the kind of shift in the balance of power that, that has emerged since then. Um, but at the time, you know, we were we were, uh, there were two options that we could go and we should have done both, but we lean much more into this sort of public facing escalation rather than a sort of more internal among people on strike, uh, consolidating that power and, and the leverage that we had already um, wielded. Useful analysis. We have, um, we have a couple of questions that I'd like to uh, bring up to, to um... This will be first a question uh, for, for our Santa Cruz comrades. Uh, for people who are listening who are not aware, when we refer to minority in the UC Santa Cruz strike, we really mean minority in this way. Santa Cruz is one of nine campuses in the UC system. It was the only one that was on strike. Um, it is a single bargaining unit. That is to say they bargain a master agreement that covers uh, the whole state. Um, and it was also, as I think you have gathered, it was a wildcat strike, meaning they were bargaining mid-contract. Um, there is a question here that is um, relevant because this was something that began to happen because the strike was so compelling and so powerful. It did begin to spread to other campuses and then the pandemic struck. So the question is, could you speak to both the difficulty and the necessity of spreading the strike to other campuses? Um, how did this change the balance of power? Do you think it was needed to win? And I, I would say, do you think it would be needed to win in the future? So um, Jack, maybe you wanna take a, take a shot at that. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a really fascinating question, I think. Um, and I would probably address it in the same way as Stefan address the previous question where once you have the grades withheld uh, and then you're facing retaliation, um, you have to sort of escalate and respond. And Joanna said this as well. And we did this with the picket line. We did this by you know fully closing the campus uh, a few times, this sort of thing. And a huge part of this was trying to you know, spread the strike as like a, you know, a, 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 as, a as a motto and as, as a deep practice. I mean, Stefan and I, I traveled up to Berkeley, other people traveled, um, and Stefan, in fact, also did, went to went to Southern California at, at one point. Um, and the like images we saw in other campuses was firstly like gave us a lot of morale. You know, they're just staggering numbers of people uh, out. Not only you know there was a sort of like you know don't retaliate against the Santa Cruz Wildcats, and also like give us a cola as well. Uh, you know, we need a cola. Um, so there are like two parts of that that were really. Um, you know, really important, really, really valuable. At the same time, I think um, maybe a, a, a form of self-criticism would be to say that we, we maybe tried to do this too much insofar as, you know, there were only so many hours, so much time that we didn't consolidate the group of people who had the grades, which was the question, which was the decisive question about who was to be fired was who still had grades and who didn't. And, you know, were like, you know, we lost, you know, more than half of the people when we had the firing threat and the deadline from, from Janet Napolitano um, and had more held on or had almost everyone, for example, held on to that time. Who knows how that would have shifted things? In saying that, um, it was still really important to see this, you know, spread across the UC system. I think it, it, it struck fear into not just the local administrators, but the, you know, the system as a whole. 
uh, and it represented like huge amounts of like possibility. And, you know, again, it's one of these um, impossible counterfactuals, but I, what, what, what might have happened had the, you know, the very first day of the, the wildcat as it was declared at UC Berkeley not being the first day of the California lockdown, you know, the, the very same day, um, because I, you know, I wasn't up there, obviously, but my, I can only expect it was similar to our situation where, you know, we were able to build a certain kind of uh, uh, solidarity and uh, confidence by being with each other. Whereas had we tried to do that strictly online from the very first go in the onset of this, you know, global pandemic, that that's a different kind of challenge. Um, so who knows, like that may have paid off differently in a different world. Um, but nonetheless, I think a, a lesson that we'll take forward for any other moment like this is like the, the people who are doing the action are, are like, that's where the power is. And as like distracting, uh, as like spectacular as some of the things that were going on right in front of us on that picket line in that intersection um, at the sort of, you know, the major entrance to our campus, we could have spent more time, you know, on the phone, meeting, talking with, with the people who had, who had who still had the grades and still had that like, that power, that leverage um, that, that we needed. Thank you. There's a, another question, an observation and a question, um, which I'll pose to uh, our sisters from Columbia and let you decide which of you would like to respond. Um, the foundation of both of your strikes uh, seem to have been set far in advance by building up rank and file relationships and militancy. Uh, what would you recommend to higher ed organizers who are listening, who may feel the pull into the active space to try and convince ambivalent leaders instead of building rank and file power? By the way, this is a question for many of us in the labor movement. What the pull away from focusing on our members and building up those rank and file relationships. So I am very appreciative of the person who asked this question. Katrine, Joanna, who would like to respond? Yeah, maybe we can take this. Um, yeah, this is um, because I've been organizing in the context of a caucus for a long time. And our caucus has only been in leadership quite recently. Um, and I will say that in the early kind of days of the caucus, we spent a lot of time engaging in these kind of fights with leadership, inconsistently bickering and spending meetings like filibustering um, because we were just like unhappy with the decisions that were being made. Um, and there was kind of this turning point where um, some workers actually after the UCSD Kohler strike wanted to go on strike and union leadership kind of turned away from um, those people who wanted to go on strike, that the organizing started to take place outside of um, these sort of classic union spaces. So the bulk of my kind of organizing experience didn't happen um, in the organizing committee meetings or in the bargaining sessions. Like they happened when I was kind of organizing a rank and file led rent strike. Um, I was talking to a lot of people and trying to like build up a kind of network. Um, some of us started organizing the language departments um, not under the caucus or anything, we were just like, we have shared, you know, workplace conditions, let's talk to one another. And then I think it's the most important thing, getting workers to talk to one another. Um, and when we started doing that, that really became the foundation for the spring 2021 strike, the no vote, um, so voting down the contract, it was using that network, um, and then being able to go on strike so soon after in the fall. Um, and I think on hindsight, what I saw with this entire arc and narrative is that, you know, directly fighting with union leadership um, throughout the whole thing, just through arguments or theory or even, and now I think I'm learning, even trying to convince um, hesitant people in the squishy middle is what I call it, or some people call, call them, you know, the liberal left. Um, who are already in a, in a way in the core, they're in the core, but they have chosen not to share your position. Instead of focusing on winning those people, why not look outwards to people who have never been in the core and kind of bring them into the core um, while also, you know, convincing them to share, um, you know, your perspectives and your approach. And the best way to do that, I think, is often through campaigns, through practice. So when we did the rent strike, it was there was a clear demand. We couldn't pay our rents. We had to do something about it. Let's get talking to one another. Um, 
right now there we have an ongoing recognition fight um so we we still need to you know fight colombia the nrb regarding you know the scope of our unit um and once we started realizing oh there are more people excluded than we thought these people who have never come to a union meeting before are writing back to our emails are responding to forums saying i want to be engaged and i think that that really um should be the focus of our organizing if we are to build militancy and power that's a great answer um we often talk about uh in the, in the labor notes world when you are uh, uh, in a contract campaign obviously everybody should always have in their mind that you are building towards a strike. The very best thing that you can do is make boss fights. There is a long standing theory that you don't wanna to be too militant because you're gonna piss off the boss and it's gonna make it harder for you at the bargaining table. I think we now know that that is not wise. It's the opposite thing that is wise. Engage people, find out what's going on for them build those fights, it builds their militancy, it builds their confidence in the union, and it scares the boss. Um, here's a question, I'm not sure which of you might like to address it. Um, given the craft unionism at universities with grad workers in their own union, service workers in their own union, maybe faculty in another, does the concept of a majority strike even make sense when only one union is striking even if that one union gets 100% turnout. Does anybody have thoughts on this? We might have and not have any thoughts on that. Does anybody want to try that? I could offer Ellen just quickly that I, you know, Please, go ahead. If, in, insofar as this is you know, not a semantic question about whether it, you know, even a 100% of, you know, grad worker strike, for example, is truly a majority strike. Um, yeah, you know, you know, maybe it's not if you if you take all the workers at once, for example, um, and our university is not immunized wall to wall like a couple of them are. Um, but yeah, I guess you know what I take what I take from this question is yeah that that it doesn't you know I, I, it doesn't matter whether we call our strikes majority or minority. This is like this is a sort of question for self identified organizers to you know debate internally or you know uh, think about abstractly without the context of mobilization. Um, in a real situation of mobilization, such as happened in, in our workplaces in, in recent years, um, it's it's a different kind of assessment. Uh, it's 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 not you know have we hit this magical figure? Does this like give us the right or something like this to go take this action? And you know, insofar as any workers on our campus are, are, are taking action, you know, we we want to be there uh, with them. And and you know, we've seen. Uh, and as Joanna has described so nicely with New York, like the, the inverse is true as well. In some ways, I think you have answered an, also another question which has been posted. Um, if, if numbers are not necessarily what you were building towards, uh, how did, what did your strike organizing look like? How were you setting goals, measuring organizing process, progress, and uh, changing tactics? Does anybody want to respond to that one? I can maybe make this one. I can maybe respond. Um, and I'll actually sort of respond. Someone kind of asked a question about whether we focused only on teaching work. And I think this kind of fits into oh, yeah. part of my answer. Um, so one, we, we kind of knew, like I said before, we knew which groups were kind of the key leverage groups. And also the groups that have um, gone in strike before, who were very sort of committed to a vision of a strike that is really, you know, you strike to win. Like you strike until um, you win your demands or until you make a collective assessment that, you know, maybe it's time to stop for some reason or another. Um, um, so that was very, very important to us. It doesn't mean that we ignored the rest of the union. Right. It means that we engaged them and met them where they were. Uh, so, for example, with research assistants, many people were unwilling to go on strike, often because they were 
probably the only person in their lab that knew about the union, who knew anything about you know, labor action at Columbia University. Um, and on top of that, they had a different relationship to the employer where Columbia often is a middleman. So they have external grants. So there are these grant agencies and the money goes through Columbia. Of course, Columbia still takes a cut. So there's a whole conversation around, you know, how Columbia is still profiting from their labor. But, you know, for someone who is sort of in that position, we met them where they were. And so I think the way we, for me at least, when we were setting goals kind of collectively, it's how we move everyone kind of an inch closer. Um, it's not necessarily that they go from like, I've never heard of this union, so I'm going to go on strike tomorrow. But it's, I've never heard the union, but I'm going to come to the picket line every day because you've told me about it and we've had a conversation about it. And I'm really compelled by what you're telling me. I don't know if I can go on strike tomorrow, um, but I'm willing to kind of participate. Um, and then for the people who are already like that, maybe the focus was, are you willing to organize your whole lab to go on strike with you? Um, maybe yes, maybe not. People, different people have different reasons. Um, and for the people who are like, you know, I'm 100% strike to win all the way. The question that I often have for them is, are you willing to, to convince your coworkers to do that with you? Are you willing to talk to coworkers? So I, I don't have to call them as well, you know, since you know them, you can, you can talk to them, right? So that's kind of how we, we set goals. And it's a very different kind of goal setting than numbers, right? It's different from like, we need 1,500 strike commitments because at the end of the day, you can say that you're gonna to commit to go on strike. And when you actually go on strike and it suddenly becomes 10 weeks long, that's an entirely different question. Um, and it's really, that's, that's why I think the relationship building aspect and the kind of building a deep commitment to what we are fighting for um, is, is the more important goal. And it's kind of abstract, it's really hard to evaluate, but um, you know, I always ask myself, are people moving closer to this core of people or are they moving away from it? Can I add something Please to that? Say, yes. So I perfect. think that also um, in addition to what Joanna was saying, I think it was um, with that came kind of educating ourselves or training ourselves to move out of a bottom line kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. And so we, which we would be sort of drawn into because we would be going to these bargaining sessions with the university. And so there was this sense that there was this, um, you know, give and take and like, what are the demands that we can sacrifice? What are the ones we cannot? And so there was a lot of work of like, actually, we don't have to give up any of these demands. These are all very basic things that we're asking for. And there's a lot of work around making that uh, the kind of mentality that people would go in with. And so, you know, we were even, there was moments where we even tried to, I, I know uh, some organizers that are even here today in the, in the crowd, um, you know, really tried to do this thing where they wanted to identify what Colombia, if, if they were, you know, we would make these calculations like, oh, maybe we could trade this for that. Or, and then we would realize that Colombia actually was not um, at all, you know, seeing these two things as something that were, that were uh, bargainable with each other. And so, um, so just kind of like sticking to our principles and, and making sure that people would get on board with these very basic things again, because it was about, we weren't, I mean, we weren't even asking for a living wage at, in at New York City. We, you know, we were asking for recourse to third party arbitration. Um, as Joanna was saying earlier, something that is, um, you know, standard in all kinds of uh, labor contracts. So I think, yeah, just like, um, that no like like kind of changing the kind of mentality that people would go in with and i think that through those 10 weeks we really got to the point where the, the last struggle which was the recognition struggle so the one where all our workers that are recognized by the nlrb get to be uh, considered under our contract and that was the last battle we had to fight which was a hard one even internally because people were tired and there was kind of the sense of like we, you know, we can fight for them later. We can, you know, we we can't um, we can't uh, continue this fight much longer. And so it was really about in our um, GBMs, our general body meetings, we would which would be the main uh, decision making bodies. Uh, we would have like these breakout rooms and try and talk with each other about why recognition was important. And, um, and it took a while because in the spring of 2021 in that strike, that was actually the recognition point was the one that really pushed the no vote. Um, and this you know, basic principle that 
all our worker, you know, workers who have struck with us cannot be left behind, especially when they are recognized already by the law. And so it took us almost a full year to get everyone to see this, how this was very important and to kind of bridge the gap between what sounded like a very legalistic kind of argument to make it actually, you know, something that really resonated with people and that, you know, even now as we're kind of preparing to, um, to fight that, that struggle and to really get the university to recognize them um, you know, in, in, in their full right, because as now we, they're, we're already seeing that they're doing all these, you know, sneaky movements to like not recognize or not act as if these workers were in the unit. Um, you know, people are still getting on board with this. So people who were not even on board with the recognition fight in December are now getting on board with it. So anyway, just... Katrina, thank you. Um, and again, I think this reflects on what we've heard from, from both campuses, both unions, um, a, a, a tremendous shift in the culture. There's an understanding now that there is power that has been built. People have channels in, it's open, it's accessible. The union is, is broadly democratic, um, which is very attractive to people. Um, <clears throat> I, there is one question here, which we're gonna defer. It's a more technical question about how you talked with students uh, who felt that their financial aid might be at risk. I'll just say to that person and to anybody else who has more follow-up questions that you should definitely be planning on coming to the Labor Notes Conference, June 17th through 19th in Chicago, um, because um, I believe these all of these unionists and many others will be there talking about their experiences, both on strike and building democratic unions. Um, and so I'm gonna reserve our last a few minutes. Let me just check this. Um, showed that we can win contracts with minorities, but can we also implement them and defend our rights on a day-to-day -day basis? I actually think that's what you've been addressing, that because of the culture that you've built with these strikes, you are in fact, uh, defending the contracts. Without workers in every department, cohort, lab, social group activated, i.e. once a strategic minority wins the contract, how do you actually reach most workers and get them to defend their coworkers using the contract? I would say using the contract and other means. Why don't we finish uh, with this and, and the question that I'll ask to spend a minute or two on before we close for tonight is uh, this fundamental question of democratic unionism. Um, certainly this is uh, for, for people that are, you know, here tonight, uh, that is to say, uh, aware of the pull of the labor movement that Labor Notes has most exemplified for the last 40 years. It's um, a incredibly strong belief that uh, a, a radical, not, not formulaic, not mechanical, but radically inclusive, radically participatory form of democratic unionism is essential for building power. That this is not just a good idea or an interesting ideology, it's absolutely necessary. I wonder if each of you could close out by reflecting on some aspect of uh, how democratic unionism expressed itself in your work at any point the build up to the, uh, the contract campaign, the build up to the strike, how the strike was conducted, the aftermath of the strike. Um, and that will be, that will be how we'll close out. So uh, Stefan, why don't we begin with you? I guess, you know, for me, um, it's always about being open to what this idea of democratic unionism can mean. Because, you know, sometimes when people talk about democratic unionism, what they mean is numbers. Um, I think it's always important to think about how it is we're measuring our power and like in, in exactly the kinds of modalities and relationships between workers that are revealed in that measuring of power. So, you know, when, um, when a, when a union is trying to assess power and what it has to go on are sort of perhaps like surveys that it does about workplace issues, 
Uh, it surveys the workers represented by the unions and says, do you care about these five issues? And you know, in, in a context in which you fill in a survey, a petition uh, as a worker, you know, if you're doing it at home on your on your computer, on your phone, and you're filling things in alone, um, you could all you could easily tick yes, I care about all of these issues. Um, they are certainly important to me. Um, this doesn't tell you much though about like what people are willing to do, like how much people are willing to go to the mat. Um, I think you can only find this out through, you know, as 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 Joanna Katrin especially was saying, these kinds of like difficult to measure uh, metrics where you need to see people together in a meeting, uh, whether it's a, a, a sort of mass meeting of the workplace or it's a, a meeting of organic units within the workplace like departments in a university. You need people to come together in their organic groups or in a mass setting and see what the expressions of solidarity and unity are like in those spaces. Um, and have those spaces be open to many interventions that if you're an organizer, you were not expecting that are coming from people you don't know, who you've never seen before, who are taking ownership of the issues at hand and are, are, are generating new ideas, new ways of building solidarity. That to me is, is a, uh, you know, that's a kind of, if that's democratic unionism, um, I, I'm on board with it. Um, yeah, let, let me just say that. Thank you, Stefan. Katrine, how about you? I, I, I couldn't agree more with Stefan. And I think that uh, what was kind of peculiar of our situation was that we had this, um, and this is something we've talked to Ellen about a lot, but this open bargaining, uh, which is already not very common. And then it was online because of the pandemic. So I think that um, that was a very, uh, good platform that we had like at first going into this we you know and in, in the first strikes we thought you know it was gonna really uh mean that it, our participation was gonna dwindle the attachment to the strike people you know people's commitment but in fact what what happened is that people had access to this raw material and so they were able to come and see for themselves first how the university would treat us um, so they would, they were kind of educated in that process uh, of like, oh my goodness, how are they, you know, the lawyers would talk to us in these super rude ways. And um, so, so just like that first step of like really realizing what the relationship of antagonism was and then bringing people in and, and creating that sense of like, uh, in lieu of not being able to be together all the time because classes were canceled, et cetera, or because we had like strong restrictions or whatnot just having the feel that like there was 250 people in these meetings or 300 people, we would then go to caucus. Everyone would have a chance, to, you know, there was all these, uh, someone was asking earlier about um, whether our decision-making processes, I think were online or not. And I think they're not, but there was all these ways in which people would be noted, you know, communicated how you were, uh, how you could participate. And I think that that just really sort of eliminated that intermediary step where the bargaining committee tends to be the translator of what is going on or tends to be the one that synthesizes what the encounter with the university has been. And really it was a moment where everyone just kind of was able to form their own opinion um, and then shape their opinion through the conversations with others. So I feel that that was really kind of like paradoxically, I would never want to have like organizing be online, but it was an instance in where it really was able to, to bring a lot of people together and really politicize and educate people in that process. So um, I think we were very lucky that, of the, you know, that this conjuncture was the one we were leading with. And you handled it with tremendous creativity, and I should say, because it could have gone south, but it did not. Jack, how about you? <clears throat> yeah, I would reiterate um, a lot of the points Stefan made, and I would perhaps even go a little bit further to say that, you know, even the sort of one-on-one -on -one organizing conversation where I go in there as like Mr. Organizer and say, here's this petition, like, do you care about these issues? Tell me and get a signature on it. Even then, you don't necessarily... You're not necessarily learning anything uh, about like what's going to move people and what people will really fight for. And I think um, insofar as we can create, you know, forums, opportunities, places where we can, you know, we as people who, you know, understand ourselves as organizers or whatever, uh, can hear for that and listen for that and see what's moving people. Like that's that's what what really matters. And you know, to give 
uh, a somewhat tangential example, um, you know, from our strike, you know, we had this crucial decision to make about whether or not we uh, continue as a movement past the deadline to turn in the grades when the firings would start. And there were, you know, we, every single night of our picket line, we would have these general assemblies. Um, sometimes they were more cosmetic than serious, depending on the day. But the question was always at the end, do we come back here tomorrow? Answer was always yes, et cetera. But then this time it was, you know, do we keep these grades? And a little bit in a way that's similar to, to what the folks at Columbia have been describing, there were some people who were deeply involved in organizing who were not on strike in the sense of holding grades because they weren't teaching at the moment that the grades had to be withheld. But these people still needed to participate and they were, you know, in many cases, like very, very core uh, figures in, in the whole process. Uh, and in addition, um, we, we, we really worked hard and I think this was important to, to make the decision to sort of frame the discussion around this vote as what can I do individually, you know, given my like totally, you know, maybe I'm pregnant, maybe I'm, you know, in a, you know, and to have those conversations through the day on the picket line as, as much as possible, but then keep the discussion in the, in the collective thing, like what does this movement need to do? What makes sense for us strategically right now? Should we, yes or no, go through this deadline, um, you know, that, that, is, that is falling tonight at midnight? Um, and, when the question was posed like that and everyone was allowed to vote on it, the, it was pretty resoundingly like, yes, we need to do this. And then look, we trust you to make your own decision. You, you're gonna have your own individual risk calculus that we can't possibly work through. But, um, but yeah, so anyway, that, that's something I would offer to this question. Excellent, thank you. Joanna, we'll finish with you. <clears throat> yeah, I think in the context of our fight, and, and this is where I think building democratic participation, right? So the kind of like mass meetings that Jack and Stefan have talked about, the kind of attendance we got at bargaining is so important um, beyond just like surveys, beyond just something that's really passive, active engagement is really important. But for us, the kind of direct impact was that, um, you know, at, at many, many points during our 10 week strike, our leadership, even when it was, you know, reform caucus leadership and whatnot, um, the bargaining committee, they all had their doubts, um, like all of them. There was no one who kind of escaped that, that pressure because there's so much pressure when you're on the bargaining committee, there's so much kind of indoctrination into the employer's logic when you do negotiations at the table, right? They're experts at gaslighting, at persuasion. Um, they know how to do that. Um, and it was really because of democratic participation at every step of the way that our, we had mandates for our bargaining committee where they could not pass a contract without us approving it in a kind of mass meeting setting where we all got to look at, at the proposal and we could vote it up or down. So there were some times when the bargaining committee is like, you know, I think it's time to like drop our wage demands. And people in the meeting were just like, no, you're going to hold the line. You're going to hold the line because we're on strike. And you're not gonna you're not gonna abandon that demand right now. Um, this happened for like you know our arbitration demand for non-discrimination harassment. At some point, there was a discussion of like, do we trade the economic stuff for the non-economic stuff because we thought that you could trade it. It doesn't work that way, right? That's not how power works. Um, and 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 it was actually the rank and file who had that clarity every step of the way, who were like we've been on this strike for six weeks now, you're gonna hold the line because we're not giving up. And that was so important um, to our struggle so that there eventually did reach one day where we got almost all demands. And the economic, non-economic thing, the costing, we did so many costing exercises in university, like how many millions would it cost the university to give us like a 2% raise? Like all of that didn't matter at that moment. What mattered was that the employer could no longer tolerate our strike that the balance of power had shifted. And so the employer had to say, we are gonna do what you want us to do right now. And that's because of the rank and file participating throughout the whole strike. We could not possibly end on a better note than that. Our power is in our relationships, solidarity to one another. Uh, the four of you have represented a brilliantly, a, a process that has, there, <clears throat> for which there is so much necessity to bring this into the mainstream of the labor movement. 
obviously the conditions are different for graduate students. Um, the spirit, the intention, the goals of this are the same. The strength is in our hands. Thank you all so much. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you Labor Notes for sponsorship. And uh, we will see you all at the Labor Notes Conference in June in Chicago. Stay strong. <laughs>